Welcome to the Seeds Not Podcast. Welcome everybody to the Seeds Not Podcast. I'm your host, Mick Manhattan, and it's Tuesday night, and I'm glad you're here or you're listening at a later time. I truly appreciate you. Thank you so much. You, you are, guys are awesome. You're keeping us going, and uh, we're creating new stuff all the time. Uh, we have lots of fun stuff coming up. You know, we got uh, CFF, five years of fear. That's right, their five-year anniversary, Carolina Fear Fest coming up. Uh, we're going to be doing lots of events with them, of course. Uh, we have lots of stuff. Sturdy and I are working on some stuff that I think you're going to be really excited about, some new shows I think you're really going to enjoy. So we're getting into that. We got uh, just tons of things coming to the YouTube channel, uh, and it's just been great the whole time just been a lot of fun creating we put out a new show today it's about a two minute you know two minute show uh and it's just a a classic film review under the snobs film history so if you guys get a chance go check that out because uh we did it on the searchers and i have uh four other episodes are planned out and they'll come out every week and such just something to kind of fill the void until we get back to snobs film history which is going to be coming back in june Uh, i get to talk about classic you know films which uh going back to explore is a lot of fun for me i always enjoy that but overall it's just a great time it's just a great time creating so if you guys are into it and you guys are enjoying what we're doing we truly appreciate you i hope you will join up on our discord hang out with us there we got some great people uh so please join up it's gonna be a lot of fun um yeah just get in it talk to us about stuff and if you guys do like the channel and you're subscribed and you're hanging out or you want to tell your friends things like that but we do have a patreon it goes back helps us all out helps us run everything run the shows uh you know with editing things like that all the graphic designs the whole nine yards pay for all the the monthly debts of stuff you know uh like the stream yards and things like that but it's all to help build great shows for you guys uh to entertain and i love doing this but i love talking to people about certain things so i was supposed to have a guest tonight uh i'm not sure if he's going to be here um but fret not i can't wait to talk to him it's about his movie uh the mummy murders his name is colin bresler uh this is the first movie of his i saw i did go back and check out another movie called remy's demons um and, and he has a couple others that i have not had a chance to go check out yet i am very excited to talk to him when we get the chance uh but we're going to change it up anyway. I think it would kind of be a, a bit of, a, you know, uh, uh, you know, who, what, get anybody to get the number of that bus that hit me sort of scenario. I don't want to do interviews anymore. I think a lot of you who, uh, you know, are loyal to the channel and, and the show and watch and listen and such, I think you saw last week I burned out. Right in the middle of an interview, I burned out and I, I just changed, switched gears. Not the most professional, but sometimes the most profound. I'll tell you that. I have been doing podcasting for 12 years. I've done every aspect of it. I've been fifth mic. I've been third mic. I've been guest. I've been co-host. I have been moderator. I, all of it. You know, and it's just, they're all different skills to run the shows, to keep everybody entertained and uh, I, I'm fortunate to work with a lot of other awesome professionals that also know how to take that up. You know, you, you know, if you're not, you know, if you are a host of a show, never step into somebody else's house, you know, podcasts, you know, things like that and expect to be a host, either be a guest or if they want a third mic, you know, bring you back for another time. They're like, Hey, you just want to join in on these topics. You're a third mic, jump in, have some fun, but don't ever overtake and never, never overtake that. That is a big no, no. That's very unprofessional. So I, I, I like to think that while doing these things, uh, you know, I'm, I've been putting together good stuff for a long time from different perspectives and, and how I do stuff. And, uh, I hope you guys enjoy that. So if, and if you do, and, and you see that maybe go check out the Patreon, that's kind of where I was going around with it. But, uh, you know, it's down in the description below, check it out. There's a free tier too. If you just want to have the updates and stuff like that, it's all on there, but definitely join the discord. I think you'll have a great time all right guys uh since colin is not here i'm thinking why don't we spin the wheel of absurdity Ah, look at that it's right there let's do it shall we i love this thing all right what number we have what number do we have number 32 all right let's see what our first topic is what's the funniest comedy movie you've ever seen that's a good question so (laughs) <laughs> I often ask myself this um, uh, quite a bit. So the funniest comedy movie I think I've ever seen, it's hard to, it's hard to say. So I, I, you know, there are some, 
that just stand out to me that I just I, I never grow tired of. I, and I, I hate to say that because when I do, I feel like a lot of people get uh, kind of uptight about it a little bit. Um, and what I mean is I love Caddyshack. I love Animal House. Uh, I love Blues Brothers. You know, I love those upper echelon uh, comedy uh, movies that came out that were just up there. But they're not the funniest, in my opinion. I love them. They're not the funniest. I think most of Mel Brooks stuff is funnier. Uh, I actually think most of Broken Lizard stuff is funnier uh, in certain instances. And and to me, like, Shaun of the Dead is one of the funniest movies of all time. Does it negate compared to movies that were centralized comedy? Who knows? That's a lot of questions. Uh, but for me, when I'm sitting there and I'm, uh, you know, talking about comedy and stuff that makes me laugh, one that gets my my comedy what I like is wet, hot American summer. I love the sarcastic nature of it. I love the embellished nature of it. I think I get the absurdity all the way through. That's the absurd comedy. You know, that's my jam. I love that. You know, I love the old school stuff, Laurel and Hardy, the old, uh, the Marx brothers, Abbott and Costello, the three stooges. It's so absurd and it's got such a message in it, but the absurdity is, obscures it almost every time. It's so wild to watch. It's crazy. But yeah, I, so if I end to pick the funniest comedy, I'm not going to pick, I can't, I can't pick the funniest comedy because each layer is different. So like to me, a wet, hot American summer for an absurdist comedy is probably one of the funniest, absurdist comedies I've ever seen. Although don't sleep on little nerd, little murders. That is a good one too. Um, Oh, but how about this? What if I, what if I go by what I think is, has the best comedy in it? I don't even know if I can choose that. I mean, I don't, I, I will say this as much as he's, he's kind of known as being an asshole on set, but the early Chevy Chase movies just hit. They were just some of the funniest things. He just, even if he didn't understand he was funny, he knew how to make it funny. He did such a great job. I, yeah, I absolutely love that. And uh, yeah, it just, <sighs> vacation, God, everything in vacation is just hysterically fantastic. So I don't know that I can name the funniest comedy of all time. Um, there's just too many that pop into my mind and depending on the mood I'm in, I do, I do think that mood plays into it. You know, if I'm take a gummy or an edible or something like that, I will, yeah, I want to watch something like a blues brothers. I want to watch something like, uh, uh, you know, super troopers, stuff like that, but I'm not always in the mood for that. And, and that's not, that's more of a targeted sort of situation. Yeah. I, I'm going to have to just, I'm just going to go with right now. The funniest type of comedy to me is probably absurdist comedy. I love it. Um, and I definitely love comedy that's uh, sarcastic in nature, calling things out. I love that aspect in movies that you see too. I uh, spin this wheel again, get back to the wheel of absurdity and see what we get. Here we go. Hopefully not number 32. <laughs> and number 48. All right, there we go. So we got here number forty-eight. What movie was the most impressive set design? Oh man, God, that's such a tough question. There's not enough respect for art directors and set designers. There really isn't. And how much? Oh, there's so many grand sets, and I also it's a hard question because for me, just looking at one, it's tough. I I, I can think of tons of like sets that just looking at them, it, it's a thing of beauty. But now, if you want to get into the question of what is an impressive set that's being used, the stairs in Yankee Doodle Dandy when he dances down the stairs, it is. I I still don't know how a human being could do it. Uh, a great movie with uh, Jim Cagney, if you haven't seen it. Oh. Uh, the Wizard of Oz was a grand, it was a very impressive set. Uh, how do I not talk about a Nightmare on Elm Street set with, with the spinning room and everything that kind of came from that? It's, oh my God, it's wonderful. It was just truly fantastic. Like there's, there's throughout history of movies, like truly fantastic sets and pr or like just impressive sets in general. Like, I, I, I mean, if I'm going to, if I'm going to say any, I, and you know, and, and to kind of put this, into a perspective where I can work with it. I might say that an impressive set to me is something you're creating without ever seeing. So like super, uh, like, uh, like sci-fi sets. Yes. Yeah. And that element, you get to make up whatever you want and how it looks and things like that. But that's harder than you think, you know, just even from a writing perspective, writing about the future and what it could look like, that's harder than you think, because depending on your mood, you're either post-apocalyptic, or you're hopeful, you're, you know, you're, you're Star Trek. So, 
and, and and depending on your story and like where you take it like if it goes into space how does that look you know and and, and how, yeah could you if you look at alien which is an impressive set then you look at star wars which is an impressive set it's like I would be, I am more impressed by the artistic work that went into even the wall designs of uh, the Nostromo, uh, you know, spaceship that they're on in Alien. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the work that George Lucas and his team put into the models and things like that and the sets that went into it. Both, both wonderful. But I'd almost respect, or I'm, I'm almost more impressed with something that had so much design input, even when you didn't see it. So I, I would probably go with something like alien on that, but like, again, I, like impressive sets, like there's so many, some of the old visual effects sets that they had back in the day, really astound me. Like the Harold, uh, Harold Lloyd pictures, uh, it was Charlie Chaplin who did that really impressive set where he's um, uh, like skating. I think it was uh, Charlie Chaplin. I believe it was. And he's skating around and there's the edge uh, that just has no lip. Like he could go over at any moment and he just keeps getting closer and closer. Well, you pull away. I mean, that's all that's just built to look like. And then perfectly matched up with the uh, mirror, with the window that was had the hole painted. I mean, that's an impressive set. That's an impressive visual effect for back in the day. I mean, it was really creative. And that wasn't like something you only saw in like the early 1900s or the 20s that you we were doing that on movies like escape from New York in the eighties. We were doing that all the way up well into the two thousands. You know, I wouldn't be surprised. I haven't seen it. I, I don't know of much that have been used recently because CGI is just, it's so more readily available, but yeah, that, that's some impressive sets. I will tell you musicals have really impressive sets because I'm always impressed with like a really good, uh, you know, like a, a broadway show or it doesn't even have to be broadway it could be just any type of play where they were you could tell the passions there they put it into the set they build something really interesting when they do that for movies and they and they tend to take those musicals that way they tend to make them bigger in scope and everything else and i've always loved that i've always been very impressed anything gene kelly was in really like i mean his sets always looked amazing beautiful but i don't know that i would consider him impressive impressive in terms of design impressive in terms of putting it together but like i said there's practical cool sets that become the part of the visual effects that i think are are, are just more impressive to me so yeah you know, I, I mean it's a, there's a lot to it but it's uh something like that like you, it, that really makes you think like that's tough that's tougher than the comedy question you know i, I to me it throws me off a little bit but yeah that, that was a uh, yeah there's some definitely i will tell you backdrops though it's not so much sets but when they're on location in places too one that i was really impressed with how they caught it on camera and this is more towards the cinematography than i think it is well no i mean and the production designers and the uh, art directors definitely deserve credit for this because they they set it up but uh even like with how it was shot and this is brilliance of stanley kubrick i've been to paris island you know my brothers graduated from there and such so uh and i've been and i visited and i've seen walked all around they captured paris island really well in uh full metal jacket so i just thought that was really cool um you know it was something like that but yeah then i just really liked the or they carried the I, I don't even know if it was at paris island the film that um but uh i believe it was and either way it just it felt like you really were on a marine base there's a lot of movies where you don't always feel like you're on an actual base like if something it just feels kind of off or they throw elements into it uh but this like that movie really felt like what a marine base feels like when you're on it so i was really intrigued with that i like that a lot and that, that's an impressive impressive set in my opinion but that is a location all right let's see what we got let's roll her again if you got anything that you guys want to throw out or ask please do please do all right let me get this situated and here we go let's see what we got number 21 all right let's see what number 21 is which movie do you think had the best casting? Ah, oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I know I'm on record as saying personally that I think that the truly talented actors when you watch a movie or a TV show are the character actors. And the more well-known character actor, you know, or the, you know, the co-stars usually, things like that, the higher up they are, 
but you recognize them from a lot of things, the better the actor they are. So the more, if you know their names, they're a great, you know, character actor. Uh, but if you just recognize some things like that, or, you know, you're like, oh, God, guys and everything. To me, it's like, that's like a level of like how this actor has impacted certain movies and things. So when I think about ensemble casts, like I'm not a big fan of the big A-list star ensemble casts. I think they're the worst acted. I don't think A-list stars um and 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 not to trash anyone but like i don't think a-list stars make good actors i just think they put butts in seats and they can and people want to watch them act kind of around themselves you know like and there's always exceptions to rule like i've gone on about nick cage i've gone on and there are actors especially younger actors who are really like they're not living to the star name they're really just pushing as actors and i dig that but i'm talking like the older ones i'm talking about like clooney's julie robertson like they're fine but they're they're the same in every movie it's george clooney i'm looking at but like i can watch richard jenkins in like six different movies and or bradley whitford in uh or, is it with yeah from uh, uh west wing i can watch him in like a bunch of different movies too and i'm not feeling the same role every time he's not playing the same character it's not that i'm not going that's bradley whitford that's i'm going Oh my God, he's great as the dad and get out. He's great. Uh, and he shows up everywhere, which is the best part. I, I would love, that's why like I get starstruck around character actors because I'm so into the performance and they always do. They always deliver the best performances. So to answer this question, you know, I'm very thirsty. Don't mind me. I'm usually a lot easier when I have somebody here with me, but everyone bailed. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> little joke for everybody watching who's in that group chat, but um when I to to think about what's the movie that I would consider the like the best cast. Oh, I uh, and also it depends on the movie too. There are some actors, Robin Williams. I don't think anybody else could have done his role in Goodwill Hunting. I don't, honestly, I could say that about a lot of Robin Williams movies, and not even the ones that were garnered towards him. But like, I don't. I feel like his energy matched the character as he was taken in just to give some praise to very well-deserved praise to Robin Williams for a second. Uh, rest in peace. Um, he was a type of actor who he got a role, you know, and yes, there were roles that were written for him, but like he would get a role and it just, he enhanced everybody on the set around him. Everyone was doing better and he would take that role. And now I'm sure Mrs. Doubtfire was supposed to be funny, but we watch that and we don't think we don't, we don't think of any type of, uh, um, you know, anti, uh, uh, you know uh I, I you know trans or drag uh note to it or your know, connotation to it or we also don't think a pro um you know agenda or you know one way or the other it's because he elevates that to a comedy he elevates that to a point where it's like it's so he makes it so desperate he's such a loving dad he can't see past himself to just take care of business get a job do what you got to do he's like no i need to be around my kids at all times i need to do this and then jumping into it and like and that's what i love about like him so like to go back to this question of uh what's a perfectly cast movie if i'm going around the whole cast 12 angry men was perfectly cast uh excalibur was perfectly cast uh the thing from 1982 is perfectly cast the godfather one and two is perfectly cast like these are movies who just like they weren't even stars at the time these guys stepped into the roles these women stepped into the roles and they were just like nailed it every time and it was because they were working on a force and i also think that if you're going to talk about a perfectly ca- uh, you know a movie that has the best casting look to the great directors you know um you know stanley kubrick almost every one of his things is cast perfectly because he knows exactly what he wants alfred hitchcock the same so yeah if you're gonna ask like what's a movie that's best cast like don't don't go spouting off to me valentine's day or new year's eve or whatever other bs ensemble cast a lister because it's not acted there's no real writing to it it's just a factory machine you know what you want a really good cast ensemble cast movie that has a lot of stars but they're making fun of the shit uh go watch the player it's not a great movie it's good though it's very satirical and i dug it and then all those a-list stars are in it so like that's one to me is like they were willing to all be tongue-in-cheek and i think because the amount of like amazing stars at the time in their life when they were so young and they could get away with it because there was 1990 is the 90s and it was like there's like a punk sort of indie movement and i think they could just get away with that and it worked for them but well it really didn't because the movie didn't do well but it is a good movie so i think everybody should check it out um all right, so, uh let's pull up the wheel spin it one more time then i'll get into my review and outro and everything you know 
So let's do this. Okay. Here we go. Number 24. All right. Number 24. What we got? What movie do you wish had a sequel? Oh. <laughs> I can name many that I wish didn't have a sequel. Um, many that I wish didn't have a sequel. That's... Uh, uh, that's a great question. I'm trying to think of something I would have liked to have seen the story extended on. Because there are movies that have sequels that I wish had better sequels. But you know, with this question, I'm going to kind of go, go with the flow of it. Um, I would say a movie that I wish had a sequel. Oh, this is hurting a little bit. I, like, what would I have liked to have seen go on? Whose story didn't end? The, or whose story ended that I wish didn't end? Oh, you know what? Actually... I, I I can answer that. Uh, Guy Ritchie's and with Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law. I enjoyed those sequels. So you know I'm gonna say movies like that. Like I enjoyed the sequel to that. I enjoyed the first one. I would like to see that continue. That's a really good pair. I know a lot of people are arguing against Lethal Weapon Five and whatnot. I don't care. Go ahead. Like those are movies that I feel like warrant sequels. You know, Friday Thirteenth. Give me another one in the same line in the same universe. I'll, I'll watch it all day long. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, same thing. Stop giving me remakes. You know, on those and the franchises, give me sequels. Uh, but yeah, I would think like if I really wanted one, a sequel, yeah, that's probably where it would go. Maybe another, hello, they had a great TV show and I'd rather them continue it that way. And everybody else is pretty much dead for the old, you know, TOS. But uh, I mean, if you want to count them as sequels, because I know a lot of people kind of count the next gen movies as sequels a ds no, ah, you can't really do that anymore either yeah there's nothing i really need a sequel for. <laughs> i don't know that there's much that i need sequels for uh you know if it's been fucked up it's been fucked up i don't care uh but if it's good yeah i'm in like you know i'll buy it all up like but and again I, again when i say good i mean if it's a good movie to have a sequel on if it's a franchise things like that sure but you know no i really don't want to see a sequel to streetcar named desire <laughs> you know i don't you know i think i'm done i don't want a sequel to clerks i, th I think the three were perfect and i don't want it to go any farther uh i think it ended beautifully uh in fact before that i would have said i like the sequel too i like the second one i uh i always dig it but when that came out and how it ended i was like i don't know that i needed that I was like, it had a nice closure, but I don't know if I needed that compared to the first. As I've gotten older and the third one came in, it's like, I didn't realize how much I needed it. <laughs> that, that's, that, it's just a beautiful movie series. Yeah, I don't, I, I would just stick to the franchises. I don't need a sequel for any type of movie that's been told. Like, in fact, for movies that have been told and are clear, concise for me, if they end and you have a satisfying ending and it's good, I realize you guys are staring at the wheel, but uh, and it has a satisfying ending and it's good, I don't want it revisited. That's why a lot of people are complaining about uh, the second season of, especially right now with how good the fourth season is, uh, people are, you know, complaining about the second season again and how poor it was. Again, it was rushed. I knew it would happen, but you gotta take your time with genius writing like that. Say the same for Stranger Things, stuff like that um too rushed that's where it hurts you that's where it hurts you and it, just let the story go tell the story have an ending and and, and just end it stop letting them get in top of you about it but let's right let's uh roll some more time and then i'll get into my review all right let's see what we got let's see what we got here we go number 35 all right here we go Take this out, uh, number 35 what's the most emotional movie you've ever watched Ooh. <laughs> the most emotional movie i've ever watched that's a great question because i don't really think about it as much now I, I i have movies that that can make me emotional when i watch them but what's the most emo all right i'm gonna take it back though because there are movies that you know can like feel of dreams hits me in the heart uh uh it's a wonderful life that end scene does there's some and so in fact once you know once i had kids it, you know a lot of the the dramatic kids movies that dealt with kids and stuff like that and uh it's they're hard to watch they're hard you know they really they get you in the feels because you think about your own kids um but I'll tell you one that really made me emotional was in high school, and I didn't expect it. It was, uh, it was that. 
uh, what's his name? Batman. Um, Michael Keaton movie, My Life. I was not expecting that to be what it was because I, you know, I, of course, I know him as Batman, but I also knew Michael Keaton as the comedian. I loved Mr. Mom. I love, you know, there were so many gung ho. Like we watched it all the time on TV as a kid. Uh, yeah, that was, it was just one of those movies that just kind of, like I watched it thinking, oh, there's gonna be some comedic elements to this, you know? It's like the dream team. No, I watched it. I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, <laughs> is that movie hard and emotional and makes you think about not only your life but the lives of the people you care about? Yeah. So if I'm gonna go with any movie that was stupid emotional, I'm gonna have to say that one for sure uh yeah that 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 was just ridiculous all right i I don't really care if you guys like those questions or not i had fun with them (laughs) no i care but hopefully you're entertained but let's get into our review all right so we were supposed to have a guest tonight uh i don't know where he is he didn't message me so i don't know where uh but i watched his movie and it's called the mummy murders so if you haven't seen it that's what i'm reviewing right now (laughs) so let's get into it so this is uh the scene sounds reviews so i I watched the mummy murders directed by uh colin bresler it um stars uh jason scarborough and um lila anastasia scott uh as joe and alexis so the story is is told um basically the characters of alexis and joe joe is a serial killer alexis is a uh is a a top journalist in the city um where this takes place and she is trying to put together these connections this weird string of like murders that have been occurring and joe walks in and starts to talk to her they sit at the same table they go through and as he talks he's telling the story about how he is the killer of these people and he has all this information and uh you know as it goes on it becomes very off-putting in a lot of ways like it's uh, one thing i'll say about this movie is it's very stoic in its horror i would not even classify this as a horror but i do think if horror fans go into it knowing like this is more th- thriller-esque in the in the vein of like interview with the vampire you know when people tell me that's horror i'm like yeah i get it they're vampires but it's not it's not really what we would deem horror like if and, and when why do i get annoyed by that i get annoyed by that in the sense of like if i'm a horror fan like i'm a film fan so like this is a movie you should say hey but like if i'm going and i'm talking to some of my friends who host you know horror podcasts things like that i might say to them hey listen you should check out this movie it's a horror movie but it's just like a very stoic type of horror movie uh more thriller-esque um and more in tune with the acting than it is with the actual in most horror movies some gore or some you know action things like that so as i think about that i you know that's what i do when i send it so when i get sent to me and they're like oh it's a horror movie i'm like this is not a horror movie this is it is a horror movie it's i would i almost call it like a stoic horror um and and other examples of that of course are like crimson peak or you know i said interview with vampire stuff like that like horror movies where yes there's horror elements to it a little i would i would actually put this more on par with uh was it little things the little things uh the movie that came out with denzel and rami malik and uh, uh jared leto and such i would put it on that level of the type of horror it is it's very and that's a good level to be on you know i think this is a good movie i enjoyed my watch of it uh i really like the element uh the back and forth the chemistry between joe and alexis and uh joe and alexis in the movie the two actors do a really good job in that uh playing off of each other sort of this cat and mouse but at the same time showing a level of respect for each other but inquiring in great ways the dialogue really flows well between them and then the cuts between as he's telling a story of the horrific murders he's uh putting in how it's his art and things like that i thought that was a cool element to it and i'll tell you the ending got me i did not expect it to end the way it did uh and and i and that is something that gets major points for me so if i can watch a movie and by the end i'm not saying it was like a a completely unforeseeable ending but because of certain choices certain elements even though we've talked about this the the things that the ending and how it would kind of go down it it was very interesting you know it it just it it was was such an intriguing way to end it i do have some things about it though i I will say this it frames shot really well uh your your shots are framed well um lighting's very natural sometimes i saw some some very harsh shadows that kind of took me out of it because i thought it meant it 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 just uh like at some at certain times some of those harsh shadows i thought there was somebody else in the background and i was like oh there's another layer to this scene and and then it turned out it wasn't it was just more harsher shadows but that doesn't take me out of it the story kept me in it's kept me very intrigued 
Uh, I, again, uh, the way they uh, Alexis and Joe in the diner leave things off is very well timed, very well paced. Seeing Alexis race back uh, to do her thing, oh, it's just it really well done. The only thing I would say about the ending, and I don't want to give anything away, is like we see a character at the very end to kind of clo- give closure to that character, and I feel like doing that took away from every other point we saw him in the movie, like 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 how it left off how it left off um where everything sort of went and how it played out like i feel seeing that character took it took away from that fight from the last time we saw the character i knew it was going down so yeah overall you know, really I, I i i would say go check this out this is a very solid uh you know indie movie for me i give it a two and a half out of five i think this is uh yeah if it's on you want to check it out you want to check out something new support indie this is a good one to go with. Uh, Remy's Demons was pretty good too, and it's it was cool to watch like two movies ago. He came out with that in 2020. Uh, it was cool to see that that movie and how I haven't watched No Promised uh, No Promised Land. I think it's called uh, his second movie, which looks interesting. Uh, or his, his movie after that, right before this one. You know, to see the jump in the filmmaking, it was very cool. Uh, so Colin Bressler, uh, yeah, that was you know he did a good job with this movie. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for giving it to me uh to review and check out and such and yeah i'd love to talk about it a little bit more um so but i also have a mixed movie pick from 1971 tonight so we're gonna finish out the show with that and my mixed movie pick is godzilla versus hedora that's right i've been watching a lot of godzilla lately as you know we have our mini series going on it's a 16 parter watching all 40 films uh two tv shows and we're just gonna go through the whole thing and talk about it and each week we get together and we talk about a few of the movies this past week on this last episode we talked about godzilla versus Sodora. this one i think gets a bad rap and i wanted to throw it on here um because it's worth checking out uh the animations in it are really clever uh the story can be watched by kids and and, and they can get it uh but there's also elements for adults where it's kind of like it's funky it's weird and i think horror fans will really enjoy it uh this is also commonly known in the dub version in america as godzilla versus the smog monster it gets a bad rap but i really do think uh this is one is worth checking out again especially considering all of the creature designs in it that godzilla has to fight so uh i just want to say thank you guys so much for joining in tonight being a part of it hanging out with me uh i'm sorry my co-host couldn't be here and uh I, yeah, i'm sorry to colin bressler sorry he couldn't be here either but uh thank you guys so much for showing up hanging out having fun uh just being cool with uh, the show and us and hanging out in the snob society uh, over on discord. Make sure you join up, uh, go check out everything else we have going on. Of course, if you like the logo shirts or the Godzilla shirt or all the other designs, we have movie designs and things like that. Go to snobsmerch.com. It's down below. We also have a special promo code down there and you can get 10% off your order. Go check it out. But uh, thanks again so much for joining in. You guys have been fantastic. I'm Mick Manhattan from the scene snobs. Go check out like, follow, subscribe uh you know the whole nine yards because you're gonna also want to hit that bell because we have great shows coming out every day all the time so thank you so much for joining in uh until next time remember to be kind stay classy take care of yourselves because that's important and i'll talk to you soon take care